This webinar is hosted by the Healthcare Leadership Academy, HLA. The HLA is a social enterprise that delivers programs to equip healthcare professionals in the core areas of leadership, quality improvement, and management. You can visit our website at www.hlaafrica.org for more information about us. For today's Ask the Expert session, we have a special guest joining us today. Dr. Oseji is a remarkable healthcare leader. She's currently the national president of the Medical Women's Association of Nigeria, the permanent secretary of the Delta State Ministry of Health, as well as the executive director of Public Health Impact Research Center, a research-based nonprofit she founded in 2002. She's a fellow of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria, Public Health, since 2001, a fellow of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and a fellow of the West African College of Physicians. Her research interests include COVID-19, maternal and child health, cancer, HIV AIDS, gender-based violence, health systems management, and women and youth empowerment. Her research and consultancy experiences include uh, principal investigator for the UNFPA fifth country program for Nigeria, baseline survey, health expert and resource person for National Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, a sponsored program on HIV AIDS awareness, She's also in the Delta State coordinator of the Demonstration Community Linkage Project for the reduction of maternal and neonatal mortality in a community sponsored by West African Health Organization and the Delta State Ministry of Health. She's also the supervisor of the Health Facility Survey for Integrated Management of Childhood Illnesses, sponsored by the Federal Ministry of Health, Abuja, and the World Health Organization. She'll be sharing her insights and lessons learned as a female medical leader I encourage you to please look at the chat box and drop your questions. We will take them in the order in which we receive them. Once more, we would like to welcome everyone, ask you to please mute your mics and switch off your cameras. Welcome Dr. Seji, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing today? Thank you very much. I'm doing fine. Wonderful, thank you for joining us today. To begin, would you kindly share a bit more about yourself? My name is Dr. Mininim Oseji. I tend to shorten Mininim to Mini. Okay. Because number one, my late father used to call me Mini Girl. And then number two, a lot of people mistakenly pronounce Mininim for Minimum. And if you see me, if you see my physique, I'm anything but Minimum. That's so, interesting. <laughs> and so um, that said, um, I am I am a medical doctor, a consultant, public health physician. I work with the Delta State Ministry of Health. Incidentally, I am the permanent secretary of Delta State Ministry of Health. I'm also a consultant public health physician, as I said earlier, I'm the executive director of Public Health Impact Research Center, a research page based non-governmental organization. I'm a fellow of the National Postgraduate Medical College, fellow of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and a fellow of the West African College of Physicians. I'm also a wife, I'm married to Honorable Justice Samuel Osegi, Justice of the Supreme Court, and I have four lovely children, three ladies and one gentleman. Thank you so much. That's, that's a very rich um, history there. Thank you, Dr. Oseji. You're welcome. I I'd like to ask you, could you please tell us about your career and leadership journey so far, how it started and where you are now? Um, for a medical doctor, Leadership starts immediately you graduate from medicine. When you become a house officer, you have responsibilities. Even if you are the lowest on the ladder, a medical team, but you have patients that you cater for. And it can be very interesting that a young house officer, maybe, 22 years old or 23 years old who is attending to 
a very venerable elderly person who might even be a professor in another field. But when you give out instructions, because it has to do with life and death, that person has to comply because he feels that as a medical doctor, you are in a better position to tell him or her what to do. And so that's where the leadership starts. That kind of power comes with responsibility and you need to be able to have leadership skills to navigate all your responsibilities at that point. So I was a house officer and I went for my youth service. During the youth service, I did not, I, I was medical officer in charge of the maternal and child health center. And so I had a leadership position because I was the only doctor. And so all the medical issues had to be handled by me. And then I still went on to become a medical officer in a general hospital, Makodi. It's now Federal Medical Center, Makodi. And shortly after I started working, I became the acting head of department of the Department of uh, Pediatrics. And that was my formal introduction to leadership. And I worked there until I was transferred to um, um, Central Hospital Lago when my husband became a magistrate in Delta State. I did not have any leadership position there. I went to transfer to Central Hospital at Saba, just did four months, and then I went for my residency. Now, throughout my residency, I didn't have any leadership position. I never grew up to be the chief resident because I, I kind of finished a bit earlier than people that were there before me. And so I never got to that position. However, once I finished my residency and I came back to Delta State, I had my next leadership position and that was to head a hospital as well as to start the Department of Public Health. And I was in that hospital for four years as the medical director and then the zona medical director because we also had to be in charge of unit hospitals before I was appointed a director in the Ministry of Health. I was in that position for nine years before I was appointed a permanent secretary. And then when I was appointed a permanent secretary, I was posted to a parastatal in the, a parastatal in the health sector, the primary health care development agency. And I was there for two years. And then I now was posted to the main ministry of health where I have been to the date. So it's really been a journey and um, it's been an interesting one. And at each time, I have specific things that made me know that leadership comes from the mind. There are specific things that happen. And I knew that it takes a good leader to be able to achieve this. When I was working as a medical officer, I was seven months pregnant when I was called on call. I was the second on call, but I was called because the house officer who was first on call could not set up a um, could not set up the line, an intravenous line for a sickle cell patient that had a PCV of eight percent, and so it was just a matter of hours, and the child was going to die if the child did not receive a blood transfusion, and so. I came and I struggled with the, the veins. And after so many minutes of struggling, I finally got a vein. And when I got that vein and the blood started dropping, I calculated how many drops of blood will I need to get the minimum that will keep this child alive. And I felt this child needed 50 mils of blood and 20 drops per mil will give me like a thousand drops. And so I just sat there in my pregnant state and started counting the drops of blood one until I got a thousand drops. And the father of the child just sat back and looked in awe at this pregnant woman who would not see, who would not move until the person was sure that the child was over the threshold. That was leadership because I knew that I had a goal. It goes to save the child's life. And that is why I had to start from housemanship as a medical doctor. You start becoming a leader. You have to lead your patients so that they can get care. 
I would also mention another thing when I was medical director of the general hospital. We used to have accident cases because the hospital was along the road. And we had a serious accident case that I was not happy with the way it was managed. And so I called a meeting of the management team and I tried to explain to them that all these excuses in managing accidents must not happen again. We had a second case and this time I was on ground to show them what to do. And it was, everything worked out well. But the, the evidence of leadership was when I wasn't there because I had stopped, I had drummed it into their brains that all accident cases must be well managed before they are referred. When I wasn't around, there was a terrible accident. How I got to know about it was that my husband told me, ah, your hospital was in the news, so there was one accident that they put in the news, in the newspaper. And by the time I got back and resumed work, they now told me what happened, that there was this truck traveling to Benway State with yams, and they had a terrible accident, and they brought these victims to the hospital. And then one of the staff of the hospital, remembering how angry I would be if I came and heard they did not treat those patients, now decided to ask for 500 Naira and buy recharge card. And with that, he collected the phone numbers of all the patients, the accident victims, and started calling the relations. And within one hour, the whole hospital was filled with the patient's relations. And the, the, the problem health workers used to have treating accident victims was that many of them may have lost their phones in the bush when the accident occurs. So there was a fear that if we treat them, they will claim they don't have money and then the hospital will now be encumbered with a lot of bills. But because the relations were there, the relations were able to provide for everything they needed and all of them were treated, all of them survived. The one that needed to be referred was referred. So it was an exhilarating moment for me as a medical leader that we moved from here we were hopeless. We were driving away accident victims. When we come, they'll say, oh, no, no, we can't handle them. They are going to go to this bigger hospital without even as much as putting an IV line and gradually shifting the mind of the health workers to a point where they could decide for themselves that this is what we need to do to achieve the objective that our medical director has set for us, which is to make sure that we treat all accident victims without before we get them sent out of the hospital. So those moments, like I said, throughout the journey of being a medical leader, I have something that really stood out to acclaim that leadership role that I had attained. Thank you, Dr. Seji. That, that's a very, I, I, one of the things I hear from, you know, what you've shared so far, is the power of strategy and the power of sustainability. How that leadership is really about legacy, you know, to, to, how that you're able to put processes in place, you know, that even in your absence, everyone who worked, you know, in your team, every team member was able to run with the same vision, right? And um, for me, strategy there was, you know, understanding how we could address the problem or the challenge of um, patients, you know, absconding or being unable to pay for their medical care just by reaching out to their relatives. I, I think that that's a very, um, very remarkable insight to draw from that, from that story that you shared. Uh, um, I have a question about your experience in public health so far. And I'd like to ask, can you share ways, the ways in which your work in the public and development sector has and is still improving health outcomes for women? Because you when we when you when you spoke about your when you shared a bit about yourself, you spoke about your work around you know maternal and child health care. So I'd like to know in what ways has your work improved and is still improving health outcomes for women? You could share some of the projects that you've um, directed or led so far. Okay, um, I will just quickly share them into three parts. I've talked a bit about um, when I was medical director. Medical director, I ran. Um, a public health um, department, but we were not directly involved with maternal care because we had the ONG. We didn't have a pediatrician, but I had a child welfare 
um, clinic. And, um, but by the time I became director of public health, I was in charge of the UNFPA projects on reproductive health, maternal and child health, and family planning was a central focus. So we did a lot of programs and um, that was one of the areas where I got my capacity built because UNFPA used to organize training programs, we used to have meetings and peer reviews, we used to collect data and we were able to use the, that experience to um, spread to other programs. And we also had other disease control programs, the disease, this, the um, epidemiology unit was in the Department of Public Health. And so we had to, um, you know, but for maternal um, um, and child health, you know, particularly outcomes of women, those reproductive health and maternal child health programs were very, very crucial. Then we also had the free maternal health program that started with the Uganda administration from 2007 to 2015. And that was a program that was not in the Department of Public Health, it was in the Department of Medical Services and Training. However, before we could get the approval for free maternal to the uh, program to be uh, implemented in Delta State. Um, the permanent secretary happened to be an obstetrician and he was very much involved in Southern activities, the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Nigeria. And the Midwestern chapter had a grant from MacArthur Foundation. And he asked me to facilitate the use of their grants to promote safe motherhood. And so because of my public health experience, I was able to work with the Deputy Reproductive Health Coordinator, as well as our IMCF Coordinator. And then we all came together and facilitated that program. And we invited Professor Konofwa, who had been advocating to state governors on free maternal. And he gave us the blueprint. And this happened in October, 2007. But the advocacy was so strong that the Commissioner for Health was able to sell the project to the governor. And by the following month, November 26, 2007, free maternal health program was initiated in the other states. And it has saved thousands of lives. Now we had some hitches in the program over time. And that was because the health workers, again, many of them were seeing it as if they were going to have a lot of extra work and so on and all that. So after one year, the permanent secretary invited me to um, give a one-year report of the free maternal health program. So I had to present a presentation of all the data we had collected and calculated the maternal mortality ratios of all the hospitals that we had participating in the free maternal health program. Before then, we used to go out as directors to collect data from all the hospitals. And some of them would be asking, why are you collecting data? What we need, we are, we are overworked. We need staff and so on and all that. But the beauty of that presentation was that by the time we were able to calculate the maternal mortality ratios, we knew the hospitals that were giving us the highest maternal mortality. And we also knew the hospitals that were giving us lower maternal mortality. So those that had maternal mortality ratios of 250 per 100,000 life deaths. I told them that they had attained Millennium Development Goals. And they were so excited, they started clapping for themselves. And to my greatest shock, one of the consultants who used to intimidate me when we go to collect data, he said he can see the beauty of the data now and he's going to go back and work harder on the project. So what we are saying is that it was, it, it, it boosted a lot of things. That, that presentation also brought out the fact that a lot of the deaths occurred as a result of hemorrhage. And it was after that that the commissioner came up with a plan to ensure that blood transfusion was also made available as part of the program. So I feel that was a great impact. When I went to the primary health care development agency, um, we tried as much as possible to look at 
programs that were already on grounds funded by or supported by the National Primary Health Development Agency. So they have the midwifery service scheme and they also have the Shopee programs. And one of the major things those programs had was the working with the World Development Committees. And then the Shopee had what they called a conditional cash transfer program. So we were able to get one of the primary healthcare coordinators in the local government where this project, the Shopee project was being implemented. And that's, he came and gave a presentation about the Shopee, particularly the conditional cash transfer. And I'm happy to say that we are now, even though Shopee is no longer um, being implemented, but based on that experience, we are piloting, we have a pilot project in Delta States supported by the Medical Women's Association of Nigeria that is going to start implementing conditional cash transfer. Of course, we did a lot of social mobilization on various aspects of that. Then coming to being in the being permanent secretary in the ministry, one of the major things we have done is the contributory health scheme in order to achieve universal health coverage. So that program, Delta State was one of the few states that started it. Our program started in 2017, January. We started with the free maternal free under five. And one of the secrets of the success of the Delta State program was because the free maternal and free under five, which is one of, which are the two areas that the insurance schemes all over the country focus on, was already existing. So the insurance scheme subsumed it, but it did not go without hitches because now there were newer guidelines on how to um, ensure that the program was implemented. And so we had reactions from the health workers and I was very happy that when we went to be discussed with the MDCAN, the MDCAN now came up with um, some, um, a, a position statement because they had a lot of questions about the program. And we're able to convince them that those questions, why don't you factor them into a position statement with recommendations? And one of their recommendations was for them to meet and interface directly with the officials of the contributory health scheme. And it was in my office, the office of the permanent secretary that representatives of the HMBMD can and the DG of the contributory health scheme met to iron out some of these teaching problems. And so today, Delta State has a very successful insurance program, one of the best, if not the best in the whole country. And these things are supporting women's health. And I just want you to know that we also have an emergency ambulance service with a lot of emphasis on carrying pregnant women in emergencies. We're also trying as much as possible to make blood donation voluntary so that there is more than enough blood for the women and they do not have to start sourcing for blood during emergencies. All these are initiatives in the Ministry of Health to promote maternal health. Thank you, Dr. Osage. These are very remarkable and laudable achievements and initiatives as well. One of the things that stands out for me is um, the importance in leadership to carry all the stakeholders along um, so that they not only take ownership of the vision, they can also take ownership of the successes. And there was something else you mentioned about how that, you know, the initial teething problems and what the initial um, response or opposition when you first started the, the, the program, the initiative. And that brings me to my next question. What peculiar ch challenges have you had to navigate, you know, uh, in the course of delivering your leadership duties, especially as a woman, and how did you overcome them? Okay, um, naturally, <laughs> the two major things that differentiates a woman from a man is the breast and the womb. So child rearing and child, child bearing and child rearing <laughs> is something that men do not have to contend with directly. They have to provide for their wives to be able to have their children safely and also take for them. Them, take care of them, but they, they do not always, they are not always directly involved. So um, a lot of my postgraduate education was done during my childbearing and childbearing um, days. And so um, I had to contend with going for revision courses, 
conferences or going for exams when I was either pregnant or breastfeeding. Many men do not have to contend with that. Then, because where I did my residency was not where our family home was, so I had to manage two homes. And I recall one of the days I met somebody in the teaching hospital where I was doing my residency and he found out that, oh, my family, we are from Delta States. So he said, where is your husband? He said, my husband is in Asaba. He said, are you sure there's no, no other person staying in your husband's home? <laughs> and I said, I Dr. Sergi, we can't hear you. Could you kindly unmute? Okay, I don't know how that happened. So sorry about so, that. Okay, thank you. So the man asked me, is there any person, other person in your home while you are doing your residency here in Benin? And I said, I don't think so. So when my husband came for the weekend, I said, is there anybody else in my home while I'm doing my residency here? And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, how... Uh, what, what is it that is going to make sure that no woman comes to take over my home while I'm doing my residency? And he said, the fear of God, that God has so blessed me that the fear of God will not make me do anything that will remove those blessings. So that is something that women have to contend with when you have to go out of your home area to um, carry, uh, um, undergo postgraduate training and so on and all that. And then by the time one finished the postgraduate training and you settle down to practice and you begin to climb the leadership ladder, you begin to have to deal with stereotypes. You'd be surprised that you have this patronizing attitude of male senior or junior colleagues or even peers and even domestic staff. It got to a point that if a driver or a security man or um, um, you know any of these um, domestic staff offend, I would rather that my husband goes to caution them because of the mentality and the culture that they have been, um, they have been um, used to. Oh, so sure. they, because many of them are not enlightened, they don't understand gender equality, they don't understand being gender sensitive. And it, it is not something that you want to spend so much of your time trying to educate them. You will give them some information. And for instance, if you see them doing things that are not right, you will tell them, no, this is not right. I had a particular driver that he saw a lady that, he saw a lady that did some, drove somehow. He said, don't mind this woman. And when he said that, I was shocked. And I said, why do you think it's because she's a woman that she's driving badly? That do you not know that there are so many men that drive badly, even worse than this woman, this woman has driven. So those stereotypes are there and you have to contend with them. And you, many of them, many men feel that any woman they, 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 they interact with, they, the person must be subservient to them. And they have to understand that it's not so. A woman can be your boss. And when she's your boss, you must give her that respect. So the respect now has to be, you have to, you have to, you have to get that respect. You have to earn the respect. You also have to command the respect. So you will be firm, you will be fair, you will be friendly, but you make sure that you draw, you draw the lines. So, and then by the time one was getting to the position of a permanent secretary, Ministry of Health, I started going for a lot of meetings and occasions. And in some cases, I discovered that I'll be the only woman there. And at a time I had to tell the medical women, I am getting lonely at the top because I go for these meetings and they are like 10 men, they are like 25 men, I'm the only woman. And I now found out that there is a problem. There is a serious gender imbalance. And I now just wonder, then how did I get there? The most remarkable was during the National Council on Health in 2019 that Delta State hosted in September, 
when we were having the opening ceremony, there was a long line of people on the high table on the podium, about 25 traditional rulers, members of the House of Assembly, the governor, the minister, the permanent secretaries from permanent secretary, directors, and so on. And all there were no directors, permanent secretary, because if there were director, we would have had some women. But that line, that first line of about 25 people, I was the only woman, like a toothpick, wearing yellow and just standing out. And it can be frightening sometimes because you wonder if you wanted to discuss something that was controversial and was going to favor women more than men, you won't have anybody to support you. So it was at that point, one of, that was one of the turning points or one of the very important moments for me to know that we have to do a lot about getting more women in leadership positions so that when decisions are being taken, you will be able to have more voices supporting women's causes. Then you talked about these challenges. How do I overcome them? I overcame them by being focused. I didn't really know at a younger age that there was really going to be a difference between male and female. I was always getting good grades. I was competing with the men. So it never really occurred to me that it was going to be a big deal being a woman. It was not until I was doing my ONG posting and Professor Nimi Briggs, he was giving us a lecture and he said, if any man has two children, one boy, one girl, but he has money to train only one, he should train the girl. And I was wondering why, what was, why should he train the girl? He said he must train the girl because the boy, according to him, will find a way and struggle and hustle and make his way. But the girl, there are so many obstacles and barriers that are going to mitigate against her success that if she didn't have an education, she was not going to be able to make it or it was going to be very, very difficult for her to make it. So that was when I began to understand how important female education was. I just took it for granted because my parents were educated and they were very important. They were very, they were very um, passionate about education. But basically, that was just it. So trying to be focused is very important. And then learning from older colleagues, I have a lot of mentors. I have Professor Polo, I have uh, Dr. Elino Wajinobi, I have Dr. Valentina Ide, Dr. Claribel Abam. I used to see how they handled issues and how they dealt in their leadership positions. And I learned from them. So those were the ways I was able to overcome those challenges. Thank you, Dr. Sergi. That was very profound and insightful. When you mentioned that it got to a point when you realized that, you know, you were becoming lonely at the top and how it struck a chord for you on the importance of um, gender balance. And this is a perfect segue for my next question. Last month, the month of March was Women's History Month. And the theme of this year's um, campaign was Choose to Challenge. Um, I'd like you to please share your thoughts on this campaign you know, where we are right now and where we need to be in light of some of the existing realities in the healthcare space, you know, because um, I realized that you spoke about how important it is to, to get, earn and command respect, you know, as well as the, the role of ed the education plays. But I'd like you to narrow down on some of the um, thoughts or some of the things we can begin to consider in light of what's happening now in the healthcare space currently and how this campaign can contribute to choosing to challenge? Well, um, we did a lot under the auspices of the Medical Women's Association of Nigeria to celebrate International Women's Day. First of all, we had a planning meeting, a joint planning meeting, and we came out with a number of things. First, we said we're going to celebrate our mothers, all the women. Being a woman is something to be celebrated. We're going to also appreciate the medical women in, who are leaders in their workplace, professional associations, and so on. We're going to salute women who have been in forefront of several interventions for COVID-19. And then we're going to rally for women's equality by supporting initiatives that promote 
educational and economic empowerment of women. You cannot talk about equality when they are not empowered. It is empowerment that will now generate the equality. We're going to continue with our fundraising. We have a major project on cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, for which we have raised about 2.5 million. We are raising more and we are using it to screen, offer cervical cancer screening, as well as um, provide treatments for cervical cancer and some cases of breast cancer. Now we have an NMA stalwart. NMA is the Nigerian Medical Association. A past state president for NMA, as well as a past South South Zonal chairperson, past state chairperson, and South South, sorry, Southeast Zonal chairperson. And we are promoting her to become the first female NMA Secretary General in the next biennium of NMA. So we've had a female NMA president before, late Dr. Abiola, but we've never had a female Secretary General and we want to work towards that. So we are doing a lot of lobbying to get that strategic position, a woman in that strategic position. We are as much as possible creating awareness about gender-based violence, particularly the one that occurs as a result of ritual. We have an online campaign that we're trying to get signatures for that. Then we are trying to also reassure Nigerians that women are not competitors with men. Women have their roles. Men also have their roles. What we don't want is where you begin to make the woman to suffer through an undue disadvantage because of her role. Or you begin to stereotype her because of her role so that you deny her of basic things that should be her rights. So women are equal partners in achieving progress for the nation. So we don't want to hear people say, ah, that position, a woman cannot handle it because she's going to go on maternity leave and we don't want anybody who's going to go on maternity leave. What of the man's wife? That man's wife is the man's wife not going on maternity leave. How do you repopulate the earth if people do not go on maternity leave? So that is the type of thing we are saying. We want them women to be equal partners. So we had a lot of other programs that were statutory planned for March. We had the CSW, Commission for uh, Status of Women, and M1 participated if, uh, um, um, effectively. And at the same time, we had our National Executive Council meeting where we got a lecture given to us by the head of service of the Federation of Nigeria, Dr. Essa, who happens to be a woman, a medical woman. She was represented by the uh, PS, Dr. Nkike, and she gave us a lecture on accountability and the medical woman in leadership. So we also had our ninth regional congress of the Medical Women's International Association near Eastern Africa region. That was really a wonderful experience because 21 years ago, it held in Abuja in the year 2000 and I was just a resident. Little did I know that the next time Nigeria was going to be hosting, I would be the national president. So all these are things that we did and we are trying to come up with a compendium of activities to, from all the states. So we gave all the states guidelines that whatever they do to celebrate International Women's Day, they should present it so that we can compile it and circulate it to stakeholders. So we believe that we are not doing badly. We've come a long way. A lot of people do not understand gender issues. But when we have all these programs, you now understand and you understand why you should speak out, why you should say something. And I had a recent experience where I was in a community, a community, and they were talking about the census. And they said, oh, that they will count the grandchildren that are male, but they will count the grandchildren that are female because they are married outside, except they marry people that are in from that community. And I said, wow, this is going to become a breeding ground for discrimination. This is going to create a platform for discrimination. And you will see now that people will start struggling to get their wives to have male children by any means, just because of that census. So I just said, is there no way 
the women who are grandchildren and who are not married to the indigents, can they not capture their own data in a separate form such that they will not be lost? I was the only woman in that group. I was the only woman in that meeting. And the reason I could speak out was because I had attended so many gender, uh, gender programs, gender mainstreaming programs that I was able to look at the gender, uh, the gender implications, the implications for gender equality over the years from that decision. So we can never do enough. People say, oh, there are so many women group. It was many years ago, even before I got married, when I began to understand the disadvantages women experience. And I said, the, 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 the way the women have been treated over the years is so bad that even if we have 1 million women's groups, they are more than, they are much needed for us to be able to address it. So what I'm trying to say is from our interaction, I believe there's greater awareness. Incidentally, the theme of the biennium of which I am, uh, of this period that I'm president, 2019 to 2021, is male involvement in maternal and child health. So we actually reach out to men and talk to the men about gender issues such that they will understand our perspective. We have done that at the NMA annual, uh, sorry, NMA net meeting in December that was held in Oka. And we're very grateful to the president of Nigeria Medical Association, Professor Uja MNI, for giving us about 15 minutes to address a crowd of NMA delegates, majority of whom were men. And I'm sure many of them were hearing about the things we we're talking for the first time. We talked about will writing. We talked about child marriage. We talked about intimate partner violence. And the problem is most times we women who belong to women's groups, we gather as amongst ourselves and talk to 90% of people who are women. And we are not in the position to make the changes. The changes have to be made by men who are in leadership, there are men who are leaders of homes, men who are perpetrating this through their wrong, you know, understanding. So sensitization, sensitization, sensitization is important. But if you are sensitizing and every time you are sensitizing the women, you are not going to achieve much. That's why we said we are going to look for men in large groups and reach out to them. And we're very happy we're able to do that for the doctors. So I think we have come a long way. We need objectively verifiable indicators to tell us this is where we are concerning women's issues, women's health issues, and this is where we want to be. So if you look at the Nigerian Demographic Health Survey, you'll be able to see some trends. There are trends with maternal health. There are also trends with gender-based violence. There are trends with things like female genital mutilation. And so we'll be able to say, is there improvement? Unfortunately, even if there's improvement, it is very, very small. So we now have to find a way to localize and see what is happening in our different states and our different regions. What are the peculiarities and address them? Can you believe that FGM is the highest in Imo states, about 70%. However, in other states like Adamawa state was 0%. So if you now say, oh, FGM is still prevalent in Nigeria, there's so much regional and zonal differences. We need to find out where the problems are the highest and concentrate our interventions to those locations. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Sejid. Uh, you spoke about the power of you know, collective responsibility and also the importance of having networks, support systems, mentorship systems to push for you know, uh, the prevalence of these conversations that help to improve, you know, the outcomes around gender equality. And at the same time, the very important ingredient you mentioned is the importance of male participation, because you can't win a battle by fighting against yourself. You need to bring everyone to the table and just make sure that everyone comes to the same uh, understanding. Just a quick conversation around, because you spoke about, you spoke about a lot of work you've done around research, you know, and I, I want you to please speak to um, what was the motivation behind 
establishing the research base, the non-governmental organization that you founded? And what gap were you looking to fill? Well, the Public Health Impact Research Center, which I founded, mm -hmm. we have the vision to be a leading non-governmental organization contributing to empowering communities in Nigeria and Africa to attain the sustainable development goals. Initially, it was the Millennium Development Goals, but by 2015, we had switched over to the Sustainable Development Goals. Our mission is to promote the health of the public in Nigeria and Africa through research, documentation, capacity building, advocacy, and community-based activities. So everything we do, we collect data and we use it for research purposes. We've done quite a lot. We published some, we presented some, and um, well, some are still ongoing. However, um, I founded this NGO in 2002 after I completed my course in Diploma in Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. It's a three month course in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I had finished my residency in September, 20, in September 2001, and then I got a scholarship to undertake the Diploma in Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in January 2002. As I was in London for three months, it was highly stimulating, very ICT driven. And by the time I came back, I was just wondering, if I wait for the government structure in which I worked to be able to implement all that I learned, I was not going to achieve much. And so the former governor of Delta State, Governor Duanga, was the then commissioner for health. I went to him and I told him, sir, what I saw in London, I cannot fulfill through government establishments. I would like to set up a non-governmental organization. And he gave his blessing. He said, I understand. Government establishments will kill your enthusiasm. <laughs> and so with that blessing from the then commissioner and former governor, I went on to start the Public Health Impact Research Center, got it registered at the uh, uh, Corporate Affairs Commission. And we started, got members. We had a number of members, we were paying dues and so on and all that, but found out that the dues were not going to do much. So at a point we stopped paying dues and we just stayed with the members we had. And most of the activities were just funded by me. But because I was able to liberate resources from so many places, we were able to do a lot. And we, the, the, the motivation for many of our members is that the work we do gets presented in conferences. And so, our members can apply for sponsorship to attend conferences to present our work, and some of them have done have done that. Um, currently, two of us applied for a project that we started in 2011 on the role of faith-based organizations in reducing HIV and unwanted pregnancy, and we submitted um, abstracts and we also applied for scholarship. So the AIDS conference. This year, because of COVID, is virtual, but you need to at least get registered to be able to present. We are still waiting to hear from them. But it was such a venture that one of our members present, or got uh, submitted um, an abstract to um, the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene Conference in Oxford. That was in 2014. And he was sponsored. And I was so excited so excited because I used to be sponsored to go for these conferences to present um, work either through the NGO or through um, other means. But this was the first time another adult was being sponsored. So I, it kind of exonerated me because when you, when you ask people to come and join an NGO, so they come up with a lot of expectations. Sometimes I sponsor myself to get to go to these meetings, but Sometimes I get sponsored, but there is a process and I kept explaining to them, I am not going to get the sponsorship. And when the sponsorship is obtained, because there's a process in applying for the sponsorship, then I will now remove my name and put your name. You have to go to the process. You have to go to the website of the sponsoring organization and answer all those questions. You have to be part of the research that you're going to present 
at the place you are going to for which you're asking for sponsorship. And I am really surprised that many Nigerians don't understand that. I, sometimes I just wonder, why do we think the way we do? So when our member got sponsored, I was, I was delirious with happiness. I said, now they will know that. <laughs> All I have been saying is true. You just have to go through the process. So that has kept us going. And then when we now had COVID, I asked the members, what do you think we can do about COVID? So people made suggestions and so on and all that. And I said, okay, we can create awareness. And because I work in the Ministry of Health and I had the data on the LGAs and the wards that had high numbers of COVID-19, we're able to pick three of the high um, um, prevalence um, LGAs, cone down to their wards and create awareness. So we got flyers and we got face masks and we distributed. And then we asked questions. We said, if you get to a public place like a market and you find out that they are not using a face mask, can you find out what is their reason? So that policymakers will be able to tweak their strategy on risk communication for COVID-19. And we got a lot of interesting information. In fact, we're about to send um, the reports of what we did in the COVID the sensitization on use of face masks to the three LGAs, Ueli North, um, Uwe, as well as um, Wari South. Those were the three LGAs that um, we had our members go there to carry out sensitization. So what I'm happy is that Members contributed, members volunteered, and now they are submitting the reports which we want to present to the various local governments and the other stakeholders. So it's a joy to bring up such innovation. And these are some of the things that you may not be able to achieve easily in government setup because of the bureaucracy. Then another very great success was our youth empowerment program. We started with going to schools to talk to them about making sure that they focus on their studies and staying away from risky behavior and so on. And then gradually we got young people to volunteer. What we used to do was that they work with me and I pay them a stipend and they now learn how to use the computer and they now learn how to write proposals. And many of them are either students or they've just finished or they are trying to get into a high institution. And those skills, that they develop working with us in the NGO, they use them in to advance their careers. And there are so many success stories. I don't want to start boring you with all that. So it's very, very exciting that you have this opportunity to make such an impact in people's lives and also make an impact in the community. Thank you, Dr. Sergi. I, I, I think that purpose is very rewarding you know, you seeing a need and, you know, going extra mile just to make sure that, you know, that gap is filled, you start to see the rewards of um, those actions. Well done for the great work you're you. doing. Thank, Thank you for this wonderful insights you shared today. Thank you to everyone who's listened. Our time is fast spent, uh, but we really appreciate, you know, how well that you've shared from your experience so far on your leadership journey and how that you're rich and, I would say rounded because it's pretty rounded across multiple spaces has certainly provided several takeaways today for everyone, regardless of um, what, what level you are, you are at or what space you, you work in. I think that um, there's something to be said for um, working with people, understanding the importance of people, because a lot of the experiences you shared, you know, one of the recurring themes was understanding how to work with people, understanding how to carry people along with the vision, you know, sharing strategy, um, support, building support systems, you know, all of just so people are the center of what we, of what leadership, you know, is about. And when we think about this, you know, it's, it's, I think that it's, it's a significant takeaway for everyone today that regardless of, of whatever level you are on or you are at or whatever role or space you work in, um, working with people and guiding people to achieve goals, you know, is, is key for leadership and, I, and there was something you said at the beginning about how that you don't even have to wait for leadership roles you know every responsibility that's at your desk is an opportunity to you know express you're correct leadership. my dear you're correct 
Yes. So thank you so much, Dr. Sergi. We hope that everyone thank leaves this much. session with a renewed sense of commitment to, you know, exploring <laughs> new ways that they can lead in their spaces without waiting for the opportunities, you know, and just building their capacities across every level. Thank you once again. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's thank been a very you. remarkable time of join of learning. Please feel free to keep the conversations going. If you have more questions, you can engage with us via social media or you can visit our website at www.hla.africa.org. And you can also sign up for any of our leadership um, uh, and capacity building programs. You can also visit our website for that. Thank you, Dr. Osedi. We really appreciate you. Have Thank a wonderful you for having everyone. me. Thank you, HLA. I feel so honored to be on your program today.